Hello there and welcome back to Bloodborne. This time we're going to be exploring some more Chalice Dungeons, the two Hintertomb Chalice Dungeons specifically. But rather than showing the entire thing since that would get rather repetitious due to the repetitive nature of the Chalice Dungeons, I'm just going to be showing the highlights, which is to say the bosses and also any new room types that we encounter. Ignore that I uh, focus on the lower Thumero Chalice here. I was originally considering including it, but I'll go over that later. I kind of uh, get tired of doing Chalice Dungeons after doing these two here. The Hintertomb Chalice requires a bit more than just ritual blood and requires a few bloodshot eyeballs. That's true of most of the higher tier Chalice Dungeons and all of the root ones as well. They require some sort of additional offering. So aside from the bosses, the only interesting thing that happened here in this Hintertomb Chalice Dungeon occurred at this intersection here. Passing through it the first time, killing the enemies that are here, things are pretty good. But then when coming back after flipping the switch for this layer here, we have an unexpected encounter. Suddenly, blood liquor. If I'm not mistaken, I believe we saw this in one of the previous Chalice Dungeon videos, but I thought I'd include it here just because it's a mechanic I really like, where blood liquors will randomly appear in rooms where you fell dangerous enemies if you come back to them. But that aside, let's get to the first boss of this Chalice Dungeon here. Here is where we really start to see the Chalice Dungeons get kind of creatively bankrupt. And they just reuse larger enemies from the base game as bosses here and give them inflated HP bars, but otherwise unchanging them. Or not changing them rather, that's an actual word. And that results in really boring boss fights, because they're just big enemies with slightly more HP, they're not really any more of a threat. That said, one notable thing about the man-eater boars is the fact that you can stagger their attacks and then visceral attack them. I can't remember if I've shown that off or not, but I figured I'd mention it. Usually it's not worthwhile since you can usually just get behind them for a backstab and a visceral attack to finish them off, but here with his boosted HP in the relatively open room where you can't ambush him, it actually comes in pretty handy. But yeah, that's it for the man-eater boar. Again, not really more threatening despite his greatly increased HP. So before we get to the second boss of this dungeon, he is this new room type which is actually pretty damn awesome. It's a large poison swamp with a rickety wooden bridge traveling across above it. I just really enjoy the aesthetics of this room type here and if more rooms in the Chalice Dungeon were interesting like this, they'd actually be pretty worthwhile, but... Alas. So let's actually try and explore that swampy room now. If you go here early enough, this will be your first encounter with a swamp-type level in this game, as opposed to the Nightmare Frontier. And appropriately enough for an earlier area, it's nowhere near as nightmarish. Although it is still pretty dangerous. The floor being almost entirely poisonous swamp and it having a rather unpleasant fellow in the distance there. This here is a new variant of the undead giant. This one wielding a large axe attached to his right hand and a cannon held in his left. Thus making him dangerous at both a distance and up close at melee range. But otherwise, he's actually arguably easier than that first one there. His really only dangerous move is a very wide sweep with his cannon that he'll occasionally do, but it has a large enough uh, tell time that you can just get away pretty easily. And as a regular enemy as opposed to a boss, he doesn't have all that much HP and thus goes down pretty quickly. But he's a tenacious bastard, so here he is, back from the grave for his revenge. Yeah, for some reason they decided to introduce this type of enemy early as a mini-boss and then also have it be the boss of the second layer. I don't really quite get the reason behind that. So as a boss he has considerably more HP than the mini-boss variant, and he also has one of those horrible 
pustering blisters there that you can pop to really take out his HP. But otherwise, he's the exact same as the mini boss variant and really not that much of a threat. That said, he does do quite a bit of damage, so if you do happen to get hit, you're gonna be hurting a lot. So you should try and stay topped off on HP at all times. I didn't catch this when I was playing through this part, but good god, that was an awful sounding scream. He probably did him a favor by nixing his life. But anyway, the third and final boss of the Intertomb Chalice Dungeon is another retread, but at least this time it's a retread of an actual proper boss type enemy. The Bloodstar Beast. It's not really any different than the one we encountered deep in Old Yanum. Just has more HP and more damage, but otherwise, you pretty much take him down like you did the first time, or take her down rather. With well timed stagger shots and follow up visceral attacks, especially if you happen to have high skill like Lillian here, and thus especially powerful visceral attacks. But yeah, there's really not much else to say about the boss. It's a retread, we've gone over it before, it has nothing new. And again, this is the most interesting that this Chalice Dungeon here has to offer. It's really just a good example of just how bad the Chalice Dungeons are in offering new interesting things. They'd really be much better off as just one area in the base game with all the new unique stuff and then that's it. But it is what it is. And here the Bloodstar Beast goes down again. But now that we've beaten the Hintertomb Chalice Dungeon, we can now gain access to the lower Hintertomb Chalice Dungeon, which is a fair bit more interesting in terms of uh, the bosses it has. But other than the bosses, it is similarly boring having no new room types and no new enemy types, unfortunately. So I mentioned that it has interesting bosses, that is not true for the first boss, which again is just a repurposed, slightly tougher enemy from the base game, in this case a brain sucker. It's slightly more dangerous now that you can't take it out in one thrust attack, but still not that threatening. If you have a reliable source of non-physical damage or of thrust damage, in this case we're using blood damage, then it goes down pretty damn quickly. If all you have is slashing or blunt damage at your disposal, then you just want to bait out one of its grab attacks, stagger it, and go for viscerals, which also do incredibly high damage. It takes like two or three, even with low skill, to take them out. But yeah, it's, that's about it. <laughs> so the second boss is where things actually get interesting, is it's entirely new. The Forgotten Madman. He is a hunter type enemy, like a, another player. And his equipment is pretty interesting. He's wielding the Ludwig's Holy Blade, buffed with the ephemeral phantasm shell that we got uh, back in Bergenworth, if you remember. He's also using Ludwig's rifle and is wearing a rather interesting armor set. Otherwise, he's basically a church hunter who went mad in the catacombs, and yeah, when he kills you, he gestures, which is pretty great. I'm actually quite glad I died there, so I got to show that off. So, let's try that again. Hopefully, things will go th a bit better this time. Here, we're taking advantage of the Threader Kane's transform mode, which can attack from far outside of his attack range, and thus kind of cheese him especially when he's using the transform moveset of the Ludwig's Holy Blade, which is slow enough that we can just constantly interrupt what he's trying to do and stunlock him pretty damn well.
things get interesting when you get him down to a third of his health though. That's when his buddy, the Madman's Escort, shows up. And he complicates things quite a bit. With him there to serve as a distraction, it can be difficult to take out the forgotten Madman. And that, plus the fact that the Madman's Escort has considerably less defense and HP, means it's generally best to focus on the Escort once he shows up and then take out the forgotten Madman after the fact. But whoever you decide to target first, it can be difficult to take them out just because both of these guys are pretty damn aggressive and don't give you too many chances to safely attack, and especially if you're not paying attention, you can get tricked into a corner like that. And the escort does a gesture after killing you as well. I really do enjoy that, it makes them feel more like other players than just mindless NPCs. But third time's the charm, so hopefully this works out. If you're an arcane inclined character, the Executioner's Gloves can actually come in very handy here, as they can allow you to attack at a distance and get some damage off without putting yourself at risk. And they do especially good damage to the Escort, who doesn't have as much arcane defense as the Madman. But uh, yeah, whittling them down slowly is pretty much the order of the day here, and once you get the madman by himself, he's not that hard to take out, although you shouldn't get overconfident since it's not like he's gotten any weaker, he can still take you out just as quickly if you're careless. Since he's at such low HP, I try to go for some sort of fancy win and it nearly gets me killed here, so again, don't be overconfident. We do, however, get a nice kill with the Argue of Briatus, though, so that's nice. So that's two bosses down and one to go, and the lower Hintertomb Chalice has saved the best for last. Say hello to the Thumerian Elder. Although his model is an exact copy of the Thumerian descendant, his actual fighting style is anything but. Rather than wielding twin curved swords, he instead employs a magical staff that can transform into a variety of weapon types. A crossbow, a spear, a lance, a halberd, a mace, a scythe, I think that's it. And that gives him an incredible amount of attack variety which makes him really fun to fight the dodge timings for all of his attacks are considerably different, meaning you really have to learn this boss to avoid getting hit. Depending on what weapon you're using, you can stunlock him pretty easily, although he will eventually always break out of it and teleport in one of four directions away. If you're looking for weapons to cheese this guy, the Transform Ludwig's Holy Blade is one of the best, as the transformed R1s will always stun him out of his attacks, thus allowing you to stunlock him as long as you can get close enough. You can also stagger pretty much all of his attacks except for his crossbow, but the timing is pretty tricky I found. Once you get him to low enough health, he enters his second phase. If he's not backed up against the wall, you can charge attack his backside for a free visceral attack and make his second phase much easier to take out. But easier is a relative term here, and his second phase is pretty damn brutal, with his already pretty dangerous attacks getting all sorts of upgrades such as his mace leaving mines behind, his scythe attacks getting these crazy projectiles that shoot out and increase its effective range, and even getting some new, even more dangerous attacks. And that's why I've decided to break out the Executioner's Gloves, one of the main reasons to go arcane, and that they can cheese him and other enemy types for that matter. 
Simply use them from a medium distance where the enemy either will not attack or will not have the ability to reach you with its attacks, and then approach forward. By the time the enemy tries to attack you, it will already have been hit by and stunned by the projectiles from the gloves, thus freeing it to be hit by your melee attacks and making the Thumerian Elder in particular really easy to take out. Kind of a joke. Otherwise, he's a pretty tricky boss. But yeah, overall a fantastic boss and one that I wish was in the main game so that more people, those who choose not to do the Chalice Dungeons, could experience it. But that'll be it for now. Hope you enjoyed watching and be prepared for next time when we finally explore Yahagul Unseen Village.